my challenge. Can I build something as powerful as this in a small, discrete form factor like this? Follow me after the break to find out. I think some of you may be able to relate to this. You move into a new workspace or a new office space and your space requirements have changed. That's the case for me. As you saw in the intro, my original machine is a monster. And that machine is built in a Corsair Obsidian 1000D super tower enclosure. So my goal is to build something as powerful as that in a mini ITX case. I need something small and discreet that can fit on my desk in a new workspace which means I'm gonna have to go the mini ITX route, which brings some challenges considering the requirements for my PC. I don't wanna sacrifice the high-end power that I had in my Corsair enclosure. With that in mind, I went ahead and did my research, and I ended up choosing the Meshroom D by SSUPD. And that's because I had two requirements that I had to consider. One, airflow. Since my needs require a high-end PC, I'm gonna have high-end components, and those high-end components generate a lot more heat. And considering the tiny space constraints, in a mini ITX case, I'm gonna need something that's gonna help provide good airflow for heat dissipation. And if you're hearing the name, mesh room, mesh is the main component of this ITX case. And that's gonna help me maximize airflow and help with heat dissipation when using the high-end components that I decided to use. And secondly, the next requirement I had is I wanted a case that I didn't have to make too many compromises with. In that Corsair enclosure, there were no compromises. So I still wanna use a large high-end graphics card and I need a mini ITX case that's gonna be able to handle a large graphics card as well as a larger power supply that's gonna be able to power the, all the high-end components that I'm gonna be using. So with both boxes checked, the Meshroom D it is. Now I'm not gonna waste any more time. Time to get into the build. I'm looking forward to the challenge. I'm gonna to try to capture everything I can if there's anything I'm missing or you have any questions or even suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. I'll get back at you. All the parts that I decided to go with are on the screen now, and I'm going to leave links to everything in the description below, just in case you want to build a similar machine. Let's get into it. First, we need to get started with the motherboard. For this high-end build, I decided to go with the AMD platform, and my motherboard of choice is the Asus ROG Strix X670EI gaming Wi-Fi. One of the reasons I went with this motherboard is because it runs on AMD's latest AM5 socket platform, for which they say compatible motherboards will be able to handle whatever newer processors they release in the next few years. My first steps are to install the core components on the motherboard, which consists of the CPU, RAM, and if you have M.2 drives, you would install those as well. For the CPU, I went with the Ryzen 9 7950X. I wanted to go with a top-line mainstream chip in AMD's platform, and the 7950X fits the bill. As for the RAM, I went with 64 gigs of Kingston's Fury Beast DDR5 6000 sticks. On the storage front, I went with the Crucial T700 Gen 5 NVMe M.2 solid state drive for my main OS drive, and a Samsung 980 Pro Gen 4 NVMe drive as my secondary storage drive. Now it's time to get these installed on the motherboard. Let's install the CPU, my Ryzen 9 7950X. This motherboard and CPU pairing provide me with the flexibility of keeping the same AM5 motherboard if I feel the need to upgrade my CPU down the line. Not to mention the PCIe 5 support, providing the options of Gen 5 NVMe M.2 drives and DDR5. All right, the CPU installation is pretty simple. You'll want to align the arrow on the top left corner of the CPU with the arrow on the AM5 socket, which should also be on the top left corner. Lift the latch to open the socket frame and then gently place the CPU in the socket with the arrows aligned. Then close the frame and push the latch down to lock the processor in place. Next, we can install the Kingston Fury DDR RAM sticks. RAM installation is also pretty simple. This RAM kit is a 64 gig RAM kit that consists of two 32 gig sticks. This motherboard maxes out at 96 gigs of RAM, so in the future, I may look to push it to the max. 
First, we want to make sure the latches are open on each slot. We want to make sure the notch in the middle of the slot aligns with the notch on the ram sticks. Once you have everything lined up, press down firmly on the ram stick and you should see latches on the side of the slot snap closed, locking the ram stick in place. Double check to make sure they're both locked in and then we can move on to the next component. Now it's time to install our storage drives, the Crucial T700 and the Samsung 980 Pro. On this motherboard, the M.2 slots are vertically stacked. Slot 1 is directly on the motherboard, and that is the Gen 5 M.2 slot I will install the Crucial T700 in, since that is my Gen 5 NVMe drive. Slot 2 is located on the top slot of the heatsink riser. It is a Gen 4 M.2 slot that stacks vertically above the first slot. This is where I will install the Samsung 980 Pro since that is my Gen 4 NVMe drive. Once you're aware of how all of this is laid out, it's time to get the drives in place. Typically, it's a simple install for the NVMe drives. You make sure that the notches align on the NVMe sticks and the M.2 slot, and it slides in pretty easily. There's a notch at the back of the NVMe drive that aligns with a screw on the motherboard to secure the drive in place. The heatsink riser is used for the dual purpose of securing the slot 1 drive in place as well as house the vertically stacked second M.2 slot. So after securing the heatsink, we can install the Samsung 980 Pro and the M.2 slot housed on the top of the heatsink. This is a pretty nifty solution for space savings on a small motherboard like this. Although I've seen other motherboards add additional M.2 slots on the back to save space. Oh, and please don't be like me. Make sure to read the manual for any motherboard that you've never built on before. I missed installing the ROG FPS2 card on my initial setup of the MOBO. There are two USB-C SATA mail connectors in front of the RAM slots. For proper front panel cable connectors, you're gonna to wanna to install this ROG FPS2 card. There we go. The motherboard is ready to be installed in our case. With the easy part done, now we get into the real fun. Time to prep the case for the build. Out of the box, the case comes fully assembled with everything secured inside for shipping purposes. So we have to disassemble the case and determine how we need to configure things to fit our parts for the build. We begin with removing the side panels and the brackets for the liquid cooler's radiator. Side panels are toolless, but be careful because panels can be easily bent. If the rear I.O. panel is filled, pop that out as well as the expansion slot fillers below. And screw in the screw mounts that will be used for mounting the motherboard into the case. Now secure the motherboard in the case and don't skip any of the mounting screws but make sure not to over tighten them. Once secured, we can get started with the power supply. Now we have to figure out which orientation will be best to install the power supply, which will help provide the best clearance for the AIO radiator and the graphics card. For the power supply, I went with the Corsair SF1000. It's a fully modular SFX power supply. Next up, it's time to install the liquid CPU cooler pump and its 240 millimeter radiator. Before installing the pump, you need to apply thermal paste to the CPU. For the cooler, I chose the Cooler Master Liquid PL240 Flux CPU Liquid Cooler. Now let's try to get this pump and radiator installed. Because we don't have much space to work with, after installing your CPU pump, you need to connect the pump's power cable to the motherboard. The space is tight, so trying to get things lined up and not bending the holes too much to restrict liquid flow is a little tricky. After figuring out proper hose placement, get the bracket lined up so that you can secure and mount the radiator to the left side of the case. And get the radiator fans cables routed because they need to be connected to the power source. You won't have much space to work with after mounting the radiator. 
Once mounted and you've done some tidying up, it's time to install the graphics card. For the graphics card, I chose the power color AMD Radeon RX 7900 XT. It's a large card filling two expansion slots on the case. Now that that's done, time to get the case fans mounted. First, I need to install the rear exhaust fan. Then we move on to the intake fans on the bottom of the case. This is a mini ITX case, so as expected, the fit is snug, but this is the main reason why I chose the Meshroom D. There isn't much clearance below the graphics card, so I went with the Corsair AF120 RGB Slim Thin Profile Fans. These are great for small form factor builds. With that completed, now time to connect all RGB fans to the RGB controllers. Again, with small form factor builds, I can't emphasize enough cable management, cable management, cable management. Of course, I created more work for myself by deciding to go with the RGB fans, which require extra wiring. The fans are the final piece, so before tidying all the bits up and zipping up the case, let's do a quick test to see if we get power and if we get lights on all the case fans. We got lights. Let's clean things up a bit and get into the finished product. Now that was fun. I always enjoy a good PC build, especially when I'm happy with the final product. This definitely adjusts my needs. The Meshroom D is a great size for my desk. Now, will it completely match the performance of my Corsair build? Only time will tell. There are a few components that I omitted from that build, which I really don't need. Quite honestly, that build might have been overkill, but this new build will be my new production PC for editing content on this channel. So I'll keep you updated on the performance in the long term and whether or not the Meshroom D holds up its end of the bargain. Is it gonna keep things cool enough for me to really push this machine? In my follow-up video, I'll post benchmarks, temps, and everything. And if it doesn't meet expectations, then I'll let you know if it's time to move on. And if so, I'll document the new build. If you have any suggestions or recommendations for another mini ITX case, please share in the comment section below. But in the meantime, please smash that like, subscribe, and notification icon to get notified whenever I drop another video. Oh, and please remember, stay positive, spread love, and try to be helpful in this world today. I'll see you in the next video. Let's get it.